Hi, it's Kirby Summers, and I welcome you to the Epstein Project podcast. I am going to once again have a conversation about some of the information I found and I included in my new book, Ghislaine Maxwell, an unauthorized biography. The response, it's only been out, I think, for two days, and I'm still in the middle of mailing to people, but the response so far has been incredible. Um, I do have a lot of interesting, oddball kind of information that nobody has really written about. Um, The book primarily uh, details the first 30 to 31 years of her life. Uh, However, I do include tidbits about Epstein. What I discovered as I wrote this book which I began by exploring Robert Maxwell's life. And then, of course, as you have heard, she was always described as being the one most like him. And she was. Um, There are some interesting observations, and I'm going to start with the latest one. So... um, I stumbled upon a photograph taken by a well-known photographer who used to run around London and pretty much take pictures during the 1970s, the 1980s. Um, He's pretty well-known, and it was through his work that I discovered Ghislaine's early life in the party scene of London. You know, there were these clubs like Annabelle's and others that she attended when she was, you know, very young, 20, 21, that also uh, the royal family attended, like, you know, Prince Charles with Diana, and also Prince Andrew was there. Um, However, This same photographer um, was connected to Donald Trump. And the reason he was connected to Donald Trump, I believe, is because Robert Maxwell had a friendship with Donald Trump that preceded Trump's going on stage, let's say, in the 1970s when he sort of came into Manhattan and, and, and tried to make his mark in the New York City real estate. Well, before him, you know, his father, Fred Trump, was in real estate um, for for the entirety of his adult life. And um, I found m- many connections between Fred Trump, Robert Maxwell, attorneys, public relations people, just people in general. And so that when we have seen, for example, Donald Trump on the Lady Ghislaine, which is Robert Maxwell's yacht, he's there because he's a friend of Robert Maxwell's. Not only is he a friend, I discovered, because he didn't show up on the Lady Ghislaine for a party. He showed up with Roy Cohn, who was his attorney, Roy Cohn was also the attorney for the heads of the five mafia families in New York City. Roy Cohn was known by almost everyone, and hopefully by this point, by everyone, for running a a child prostitution ring, which uh, really should be called a child trafficking ring. Um he was known to also have in his possession photographs taken of FBI director J. Edgar Hoover, of him, you know, doing something that was considered illegal at the time with his partner, uh, Clyde Tolson, and other things that sort of kept. J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI from ever doing anything with the mafia. In any event, when Donald Trump divorced his first wife, 
he married Marla Maples. However, Ghislaine Maxwell be, had become very friendly with Ivana Trump. She has been her friend, and it's my understanding through a source that she is still her friend. To present day, they, they communicate from jail on a regular basis. So when Donald Trump left Ivana, uh, and that sort of began in 1990, you know, and 1991, uh, so that when Donald Trump was invited, for example, to the Lady Ghislaine in March, when Robert Maxwell was in, the New in New York City, and he docked the Lady Ghislaine next to the United Nations, which is where he always kept her, um, he invited Donald Trump onto the yacht afterwards. Donald Trump showed up with Roy Cohn and Roy Cohn's partner, who was always sort of like in the background, but he also was a heavy hitter and he stayed in the background for, for good reason. Ghislaine being friendly with Ivana was not going to attend Donald Trump's wedding, which happened on, let me just find that date for you. It happened on December 20 of 1993. So my book doesn't go into 1993. That's sort of like part two. Um, however, when he married Marla Maples and he had this really big lavish wedding at the Plaza Hotel, which he owned. Um, there's a photograph taken by the same photographer who used to follow Ghislaine Maxwell around and all of her friends who were in high society and the royals. And he's taken photographs of Prince Andrew when he was very young, also partying. Um, he was at this wedding and he took a photograph of Jeffrey Epstein walking out or walking into the plaza with Leslie Wexner and Wexner's wife, Abigail, who, by the way, had just become his wife. So they're newlyweds. Uh, so Epstein is shown wearing an interesting outfit. Uh, he's always wearing an interesting outfit. I, I, you know, I don't know what it is with him. Uh, but, you know, Leslie Wexner was invited, as was obviously his new bride, the three of them are there. The guest list was a thousand people. Um, as a side note, Trump was a lot like Maxwell, who in many ways Jeffrey Epstein emulated. So for example, Trump never paid for the wedding. Uh, he billed it to the company because he owned the, the plaza at the time. And um, he didn't pay his bills because as we understand historically he overpaid for it to begin with and he got into a lot of trouble because he started buying things left and right that he could not afford and ultimately the banks decided you know no more money for you and he defaulted and he had to sell everything and he lost the plaza pretty much something similar happened to robert maxwell where he borrowed more than he could afford, and he spent more than he than he could ever repay, and we know that ultimately he was like man overboard. Um, so I thought it was interesting to see a photograph because it's rare. We don't really see a photograph of Jeffrey Epstein with Leslie Wexner, CEO of Victoria's Secret owner of L Brands, the man who pretty much created the myth that we know today as Jeffrey Epstein. So I wanted to bring that to your attention. The photograph is on my Twitter. Um, I posted it today, so you should be able to find that. So I just, you know, I'm just going to go over a couple of um, tidbits that you're going to find when you read my book. And, and by the way, I've got tons of stuff that nobody's ever written about. So I'm not really letting the cat out of the bag. I just want to um, go over this stuff because I found it to be interesting. Now in the Jewish tradition, there's something called sitting Shiva. 
And what that is, is um, it's for the immediate family members. It's a week-long period of mourning. When I was researching um, Robert Maxwell's death and the fact that, yes, his body was flown to Israel where he was buried on the Mount of Olives and all the dignitaries came and paid, you know, paid their respects and his wife was told something about, you know, everything he's done for Israel and, uh, you know, how it cannot be told at this time and sort of that's a very telling line. Um, they had chartered, the Maxwell family had chartered an airplane to take them from London to Israel for the funeral. After the ceremony and he was buried and, and the family just turned around, they thanked everyone. They got into their limousines. There were a lot of rented limousines and the limousines drove straight to the airport where they got onto their chartered plane and they went home and they all went home and, and began to reinvent themselves. Ian and his brother, Kevin became sort of the fall guys. Um, and in a way they were part of what his father, what their father did. Right. I mean, they were part of the company. They worked alongside their father they knew what was going on, but so, so they came under scrutiny and at some point they were arrested. Ghislaine Maxwell, on the other hand, as we know, she came to New York, but she came to New York after meeting Jeffrey Epstein in a very interesting way that I describe in my book, which I'm not going to spoil at this minute. Um, my point is that at no point did the family sit Shiva for Robert Maxwell, which I thought was interesting, you know, so that what it reinforces is that what we're talking about are people who are extreme Zionists, because it really has nothing to do with regular Jewish people. Regular Jewish people, when a loved one dies, they sit Shiva. It's, it's you know, that's what you do for a loved one. These people um, appear to have very superficial feelings, if feelings at all. And so they didn't do that. The other thing that I thought was just really caught my attention was that Robert Maxwell was buried without any of his organs and uh, even without his brain and as macabre as that sounds, um, it was only when Betty Maxwell discovered or remembered that the brain was still in Spain in a laboratory in Spain, which is where the first autopsy was done, only at that point did she, you know, make any effort to retrieve the brain and the organs and eventually, you know, buried them with Robert Maxwell. Um, let's see if there's anything else here that I want to share with you because I, I, you know, while I want, I'm very excited about this book. I also want to keep some of it um, a mystery for you. Okay, so the first photograph of Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell, interestingly enough, it takes place at the Plaza Hotel in November of 1991, a couple of weeks after Robert Maxwell has died. And... Um, it's the first one of them sitting next to each other. They're sitting with Tony Randall, who is the head of ceremonies. He's going to sort of preside over this event where Robert Maxwell is being honored and where in his place, Betty Maxwell will be receiving the award. So Ghislaine Maxwell is sitting there with Jeffrey Epstein, and both of these people are known to have used their sexuality and to be very loose in their thinking. Uh, Ghislaine shared her father's um, ability and her like for crude jokes, 
which was perfect foil for Epstein, who was known to say the most inappropriate things to women for a very, very long time. So in that photo, which you guys might remember, it has Jeffrey Epstein, Ghislaine Maxwell, Tony Randall, and by the way, the photograph was taken by Betty Maxwell. You see a very surprised looking Tony Randall. So I can only imagine that whatever was said between them was of an off color nature. And it's, again, it's off putting because this is supposed to be a somber occasion. She just buried her father two weeks earlier. And for there to be this kind of levity, this kind of like, it's, it's, you know, it, it's not somber when you were, when you lose somebody you love and your father, and she has been famously quoted as loving her father. It's, it's just been very, very over the top. Well, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't come across like that. It, it, it doesn't come across like that for many reasons. I question, and I don't know the answer to this, but I question, did she love the lifestyle? Because I know her mother, Betty, wanted a divorce, which she kept discussing with Robert Maxwell before he died, and he discussing it with her, and it was kind of left up in the air, but Robert Maxwell was not even living with her at the time. They had parted ways, and but uppermost in Betty Max Maxwell's mind, which she writes about in her book, um, was the divorce. And the question she had was, am I going to be able to continue to live this lifestyle? The lifestyle that she was talking about included having her own chauffeur-driven Rolls Royce, being able to go anywhere in the world. Now, we know that she ended up with a castle in France, although if you speak to her siblings, she didn't have any money. I'm sorry, if you're, if you have a castle that you live in in France, that to me speaks that you have something, because I don't think you and I can live or can afford to live in a castle in France. You know, even if it were free, you still have the upkeep, you still have to have, you know, help. So I don't buy the we're suddenly very poor story from any of the Maxwells. I'm sorry. I just don't buy it. Logically, it doesn't make any sense. Um, in an interview that Ghislaine Maxwell gave to um, a magazine, and I believe it was the Vanity Press magazine, uh, she said, he wasn't a crook. A thief to me is someone who steals money. Did he put it into his own pocket? Did he run off with the money? No, and that's my definition of a crook. I'm surviving just, she said, but I can't just die quietly in a corner. I have to believe that something good will come out of this mess. It's sad for my mother. It's sad to have lost my dad. It's sad for my brothers, but I would say we'll be back. Watch this space. Okay, in the beginning, Ghislaine Maxwell, when she came to New York, I know she was living in a in an apartment that cost $500 a month, which in New York, that at that time was the average amount of money for an average apartment. She couldn't even afford that and um, because she was living on an inheritance of 800,000 lira, which is the equivalent roughly of about $110,000 which to anybody in New York City in 1991 would be an, a lot of money. But Ghislaine was accustomed to partying. She was a social animal. That is what she knew how to do. And although she gave herself different, a different um, definitions, you know, like on her LinkedIn page, she, which she actually had at one point, it's not there anymore, she said she was a business consultant. After that, you know, when she was caught speeding in London, she said she was a computer specialist. After that, she said 
that she was in real estate. When her father died, the press reported that she was getting a salary of 100,000 lira and that her official title was fashion if the fashion consultant or fashion, she was the head of the fashion. Now, I didn't know that any of her father's newspapers had a fashion part, but apparently she was given titles, I believe, to do several things, to keep her doing um, some undercover work for her father. And I have many examples of the work her father sent her on, and I'm going to let you decide if she was doing, quote, spy work for her father. I include this stuff in the book, so I'm not going to spoil it by giving you a list of what she did, but I just thought it fascinating how she continued to use different titles for what she did and how she presented herself to the world. She was not, like, during the years that she was working with her dad, showing up at the football games, which by the way, in the United States, it's soccer. She was not considered you know, secretive or, you know, she was just considered a party girl. She was one of the bright young things you saw going out to one party after another. That said, she was also going to interesting events, you know, the wedding of the Kennedy family, where she would retrieve information for her father. Um, when she moved to New York after her father died, then people started to refer to her as a mysterious woman, somebody who you, you really couldn't get the truth from. So at this point, you know, she's connected with Jeffrey Epstein. And according to the victims that we have heard from, there was, you know, there was the trafficking that was going on. There was these allegations that were made. And so we can understand why she then becomes someone who is considered mysterious. I would be curious to um, hear your feedback on what I have shared with you so far. And um, once again, thank you to everybody who who follows me on Twitter and who leaves such fascinating comments and who understands this story. In closing, I want to add that it is my opinion that the trial for Ghislaine Maxwell is not going to happen. Sorry, it can't happen. Um, this is a matter of national security, I believe, not just for our country, but for another country. There are too many uh, very well-known powerful people who you know, the, the court system and the United States is not going to allow these names to be talked about in a court of law. I mean, if I only just discovered that Leslie Wexner is photographed in a 1993 photograph with Jeffrey Epstein, you can, you can rest assured that nothing is going to really happen with the case. What does seem unusual is that she was arrested almost a whole year ago. It'll be a whole year on July the 2nd, and today is June the 24th. So um, some plea agreement will be reached, or Ghislaine Maxwell will be found to be completely incapable because of ill health to be able to participate in a trial. Something is happening behind the scenes to get this away, you know, to make this go away. Now we're not going away. You know, we're still interested in it and, and uh, the powers that be, if you will, know that we're still interested in it. So how this resolves itself is yet to be seen, but I, I can tell you that I personally do not believe there will be a trial. Your thoughts are always welcome. Please leave them below. And remember, like this video. Okay, have a good day. Again, it's Kirby Summers for the Epstein Project Podcast. Thanks. Bye.